SJC 12264, Commonwealth v. Michael C. Grundman. Good morning, Your Honors. Andrew Crouch on behalf of uh, Mr. Grunman, who appeals from a decision, uh, sentencing decision out of the Barnstable County Superior Court by way of the appeals court. Um, as this court is inevitably aware, this case involved the belated imposition of a, of a punitive and particularly harsh uh, sentencing condition, uh, probationary condition, with respect to the imposition of GPS monitoring. Can you let me know, as far as standard of review, what we do with Judge Nickerson's finding that your client received notice, is that entitled to deference? It, so with respect to the factual findings, certainly they are, they are entitled to some deference. With respect to the legal findings, I would, I would suggest but, this no, I, I, I obviously know there's apples Correct. and oranges, but just Judge Nickerson was there. He was the trial judge, the sentencing judge, rather, and he found that your client received actual notice from the probation contract. So that's entitled to deference? It... I, it's, it's a difficult decision to say, because I would say, indeed, he was there for those parts, and that is important. But also, his determination that just the, act, the notice from a probationary contract, I would suggest that that is almost a sure, legal but, determination. Well, with, we, yeah, we, we have the two cases in this falls. Yep, in yes, exactly correct. But we do have a factual finding. There is, a, there is a factual finding that he made a determination that Mr. Grunman uh, received actual notice. I would suggest that that is, uh, if that is not a legal determination, which I think it, it looks a lot like a legal determination in terms of what Salavka says, uh, then I would suggest that it is not supported by the record in terms of what the actual facts were. Uh, and not to belabor those, because I'm sure the court is aware, but you know the, you know, the you know, Judge Nickerson himself determined that at no point did I inform him, inform Mr. Grunman either during. But there's, the, a, there's a transcript. What's that? There's a transcript, and we know from the transcript the words GPS are never mentioned. Correct. They're other ne than well, never, orally, not never mentioned. Never, never during the plea, never during the sentencing, never. And indeed, we actually have information with respect that I think Judge Nickerson sort of glossed over or ignored with respect to the attor defense attorney saying specifically, at least on the record, to him. You know, GPS doesn't apply. And then the judge sort of schools him on what the law actually requires. He then acknowledges it's my mistake. So I think it's, I think the record shows that in terms of what Mr. Grunman knew at the time that he actually offered his plea and then was sentenced, was, you know, until he walks out of that courtroom and signs that contract, he doesn't have any idea that this is going to be imposed. And I think that well, that's well, the problem. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. What then do we make of the probation contract? You, you, you just told us he had no idea. We have a signed probation contract at time of sentencing, which prominently says GPS. I think that, so there is that one line in Salavka that notes, moreover, the probation contract, you know, the probation contract didn't say anything. That's as much as Salavka talks about, and that's obviously what the issue is here today for the court to resolve. That's the full extent to which the court in Salavka looks into that. I think that one of the key parts of Salavka is towards the end of that decision, where, he's basic, where, the, where Justice Lank says, you know, moreover, the defendant was given no opportunity to withdraw that guilty plea. Uh, it would be unfair and contrary to the spirit of Rule 12c for a judge to accept a plea bargain and impose the recommended sentence, uh, and then the after the defendant has lost the opportunity to withdraw that plea, to increase increase the sentence by adding additional terms. And I think that that is what happened here. At that point, Mr. Grunman doesn't have the right to, to withdraw the plea based upon the information that's been provided to him. The plea has already been taken. The sentence has already been imposed. Well, he could have filed a revise and revoke under our new rules, under Salafka rules, right? Correct. Well, uh, but I would well, suggest that... Commonwealth, but, but anyway, he could have filed a revise and revoke. He did file a revise and revoke and didn't mention the GPS. Correct, because I think that what... It came 10 months after sentencing. Well, what happens then is that is when the motion comes, and that is around the time when he is looking at release. Of, you know, of course, right. Yeah, the parole, parole happens. This becomes an issue. Right. Uh, then it becomes something that people are aware of, and then it's something that tr it's tried to be addressed. But I think jumping you know, sort of back to the, to the beginning, there is no, you know, there is no, at that point, there is no, you know, the other rule of Salavka that Justice Lank laid out in that decision was that there is a 60-day rule under Rule 29A, and that 60-day rule looks pretty final by, by the language of Salavka. Uh, we are long past it at this point. 
Um, at that point, you're nearly a year out or a year out from the actual sentencing date, more than a year out from the plea date, when this issue is coming up and the judge seeks to impose what was clearly not imposed previously. You know, the oral pronouncement is what controls. The oral pronouncement, by all accounts, from the appeals court all the way down, is, shows that Mr. You know, Mr. Uh, Grunman did not was not given notice before his plea was accepted let alone by the time the sentence was imposed, that he was going to be subject to this, to this condition. And this court has said this is a singularly punitive type of condition. It is unlike almost anything else that we see. Mr. Grunman is subject to a 10-year period of probation. I would suggest that under that language that I'm talking about here towards the end of Slavka, that's something important for him to know before he makes the determination as to whether or not to go forward with this particular plea. Maybe more than almost any of the other. The attorney obviously should have known, but clearly uh, his attorney didn't know. He's mentioning a job that he's going to have, being a diver. And Clear you can't have a GPS on if, you, if you're doing that. But, yeah. but I think that by way of analogy, if there was a, 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 a plea in a, that was worked out with some difficulty, let's say, in a domestic violence case, but, um, but somehow there's a resolution and not part of the resolution, we, we don't have a batter's treatment program as part of the resolution, it's not mentioned in court, and then it's on the probation contract, that's a, that's a big deal. Presumably that whole plea negotiation assumed that there wasn't. I would suggest that that is, that a batterer's program falls far lower on the, on the rung of importance in terms of the severity of the punitive nature of that punishment than GPS monitoring. This court in Cori, this court in, in Salavka, in a host of other cases with regards to you know, CPSL and other cases, talks about the singularly punitive nature of the government monitoring your every move for a period of a decade. I think that that's a distinction between that and a batterer's program, which may last a matter of weeks. I'm, so, I'm just trying to get at where, where, the, where the line is. Uh, I, I don't have a view, I'm just asking your view. So if that happened, and, and the battery treatment program wasn't, wasn't mentioned at the plea, and it was clear that the defense attorney uh, didn't know that it was going to be a condition, and then there's a probation contract signed, um, and the defendant has actual notice, he reads battery treatment program, would, would that be an enforceable condition or not? I think that the, this court has looked at these cases, and what it has said, at least to date, in Slavka is this is the one above all others that has to be well, has CPCS, to be given actual notice. Uh, parole for life, obviously, is, is is would be yes, and it's the same so sort it's of basically those two. Yes, I think that those are the two that, off the top of my head, would a better. It's case by case, but I I think it falls far below, and there's cer certainly a better argument on the Commonwealth side that that is something that could maybe just generally doesn't require actual notice. But here, when it comes down to this singularly punitive condition for an individual who is going to be on that condition for a 10-year period of time, to not inform him of that before he offers the plea, let alone by the time he is actually sentenced, but to require him to somehow come back at some later date when he finds out that it's going to actually be imposed on him to try to withdraw, then the burden's on him to demonstrate that that plea was not offered knowingly and voluntarily, as opposed to him saying, look, I've, I'm going to take this case to trial. I'm going to back off on this because this condition, and it's never been explained Well, I don't think him. he's going to trial. What's that? He's not going to trial, right? Well, in this, in this case, obviously three, he's looking- Three victims and text messages? But I think, I think it is something that is part of that calculus. I mean, it is something you can't just add this punitive, you know, you know very harsh term onto it some, at some later date when he has an expectation of finality in that sentence. He has to be given that opportunity. Maybe he says, look, because of the evidence against me, I don't care that, you know, that GPS monitoring is going to be a condition. I'm still taking that plea. The point is, is that under Solovka and just under general ideas of due process, he has to be given that opportunity to make that determination himself. And where that's taken from him, when he's not, you know, when, especially the facts here, where it's not just the judge who fails to do it, it's his attorney who fails to do it. There's nothing in the process until the courtroom door slams shut and he's in with probation, because they have to write that contract up. You know, it's not really a contemporaneous thing where it's happening in front of the judge and, you know, there's an opportunity to explain things. But what, what I'm a little confused about um, procedurally, I, I know your client signed on the date, and the probation officer signed on the date of the plea. But two days later, I think it was, another judge signed. 
the probation contract. Um, what, what, what do you make of that? It's, it's hard to tell, and there's nothing particularly in the record to address exactly what happens with respect to that. The best information that we have is, is from Attorney Roman's affidavit that he says, this happened after the sentencing. It happened at some other point. I don't think I was present for it. Otherwise, we sort of have a black box of what exactly happened, where that happened, um, and that's, I you know, suppose, the nature of the problem that we're talking about here. That is why you know, you know, Solovka stands for the principle in when it comes to this particular condition that you have to provide actual notice to the person. You have to inform them affirmatively this is what is going to happen to you. And clearly, from his attorney all the way through, you know, this is different than the Ortiz-Torres case and some of the other cases where there may be, this is why I think this is a singular, unusual type of case that's not going to lead to some, some greater problems in the judicial system or in the criminal system, is in those cases, if it's part of the plea discussion, if it's part of, if it's on a green sheet, if, if at some point it's raised, you know, maybe arguably in those circumstances, the individual has actual notice, just as they did of supervised release under Ortiz Torres out of the First Circuit. But here, it's just silent all the way across the so, board. As far as ramifications, so if a clerk inadvertently fails to mention GPS, but it's on the docket and it's statutorily mandated, um, wouldn't a view be that your client gets a windfall? I think the view is, is that the court has 60 days to fix that mistake. Also, the Commonwealth under Salavka has 60 days to fix that mistake. At some point, finality has to occur. There has to be some repose and some understanding of what that sentence is. And that happens, you know, you know Justice Lank in Salavka said, that's 61 days. That's when that happens. That's a hard and fast rule. Unless this court is going to open up a large exception that swallows the foundation of Salavka, you know, 61 days is it. We are almost a year out at that point. I'm not suggesting it's a windfall. I'm suggesting it's an opportunity for this individual before his plea is accepted and his sentence is imposed, the opportunity just under pure due process principles for him to understand what he's facing to make that determination himself. In the absence of that, I think that we have, we have a substantial problem here. I think that problem, you know, what happened here violates Salavka. And while it may appear on one hand as a windfall, I think, as I said, it is a, a particularly rare case. But there are, there are you know, ways that both the court and the Commonwealth being diligent in looking at what happened, making sure that they get the conditions that they think need to be imposed, uh, you know, are, there's, there's protections against that. Uh, and where that doesn't happen, where there isn't a 211.3 or a 60-day or a 60 day motion under 29A, that I don't know, understand how that could be imposed against the defendant who you know learns about that, you know, is not told about that in you know in the courtroom as Salav, as Salavka said had to happen. If I if I could make sure I understand where you are, uh, or where we are in terms of the law right now, uh, Williamson. I understand, says, if you had actual notice through sources other than the sentencing judge, before you say the word guilty, then that's enough. Correct. Salavka did not have that, but then adds the language that, uh, that the actual notice must come from the sentencing judge. Uh, do we understand that to mean that it must come from the sentencing judge only when it is not otherwise clear from either the, the, uh, either the plea offer or from the colloquy? I'm not sure that's an issue that the court needs to necessarily address here, but I think that, you know, obviously we have cases like Ortiz-Torres Ortiz and Williamson on one hand where, you know, the person, you know, the defendant can't later say, I'm shocked to learn that GPS monitoring is on the table when it was part of the process. Then we have a case such as this where you know, it doesn't, or then we have Slavka on the other hand. As to, as to where that all fits, I'm not sure that this court needs to address that in this particular case. As I said, I think it's particularly but, rare. How do you reconcile this? I think what we do is I think the, the rule set forward by Justice Lank and Slavka is pretty clear. It's just, it's just clear. Actual notice is what needs to be said. The judge needs to be said that. Absent that, I think that if an individual comes in and it's part of that entire, it's, I think Williamson and Salavka work reasonably well together. But doesn't the probation contract say that I, the judge, hereby order? So an argument could be made that it does satisfy Salavka because it is notice from the sentencing judge. I, I think that Salavka is clear that that, seem, that has to happen before the plea is offered or before the sentencing is imposed. It can't happen post, it can't be post hoc. It can't be 
it can't be hours later, minutes later, days later. It has to be because he has to have that opportunity to withdraw that plea. If that is absent having to go through the whole rigmarole of trying to demonstrate that he knowingly and voluntarily you know, didn't understand that. I think it has to be presented to him in this singular, with this singular you know, probationary we're, condition. We're, that's an important issue um, as far as the purpose goes. Where are you getting that? That's that from Solovka, that that the timing of it has to be so he can withdraw sure. his. Sure, that's the third to last paragraph in uh, in the Solovka decision. I think the it is somewhere in. So by your reason, in the probation contract is too late. I think it's, it's even too, even if it's hours, unless the probation even if it's fifteen minutes later. I think I think unless the probation contract is is signed before. I mean, if the sentence is imposed, which is when we consider the sentence to be final, but for the twenty nine A window. That's when it has to be. It has to be done. You know, I don't think a probation. I don't think informing him later, whether in a probation contract or that day, slapping a bracelet on him, is enough to have him, to protect him from the point that he needs to be able to weigh his determinations before actually offering that sentence or before taking that sentence before offering that plea. In the absence of that, it's it's too late. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Carey, good morning. Good morning, Elizabeth Carey, on behalf of the Commonwealth. Can, can you solve the mystery of the two-day late Rufo uh, <laughs> Nickerson um, dynamic? I, can, I cannot, Your Honor, but um, I would say that the signature of the um, of the defendant appears on the same date as the plea, and so I would say that it doesn't support the notion that he signed these conditions um, days later, but rather it was contemporaneous with the taking of the plea. Does that have any effect that the sentencing judge didn't sign the contract and another judge did? I don't believe so, Your Honor. I don't think it would have any impact. It's simply um, being put into effect, essentially. That's signature. The judge, was, the judge who took the sentence, um, as I understand, would probably normally be the judge to do that, but I think it was just. So tell me what happens. Uh, we're in superior court. Let us assume, for the sake of argument, that the defendant does not know that he will get GPS. Uh, the judge does not, the attorney does not tell him he will get GPS. The judge does not, at the time of sentencing, say that he will get GPS. Uh, an hour later, he goes to the probation office and he signs probation conditions which include it. Uh, and let's assume he says, wait, 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 I didn't, I, this, this is the first time I've learned about GPS. Uh, I don't want to plead guilty if there's going to be GPS. What is the, what, what happens? I would say that would be um, the best opportunity to, to come forward and say, this, um, this wasn't articulated to me. And at that point, um, the judge could easily address that issue. And he could say, there was a mistake. It should have been read to you. It wasn't read to you, um, and which is essentially what he does later um, when he realizes that it hadn't been read orally. OK, well, let me, let me step back. Let's, let's assume that the judge at sentencing says, Mr. Grunman, I, uh, as part of the sentence, you are obligated to wear a GPS for 10 years pursuant to the statute. And he and then he says, wait, I didn't know about that. Uh, is he entitled to withdraw his plea? I think at that point, um, the judge would say, well, if you're not agreeing to the terms of the plea, because it's a required. Um, what, what, what were the terms of the plea here? Um, the plea was a two-year House of Correction sentence, and then it was going to have 10 years of probation, but they were going to run concurrent, so effectively it would be eight. And, and the only thing they said was subject to special conditions, basically. Correct. Subject it was subject to special conditions, or what was the language used? I believe it was referred subject to, to a special... Subject to terms and conditions of the probation department, I think was the language that was used. Is that to mean special conditions, or is that to mean the general conditions, which are a matter of statute? Well, I would believe it would cover essentially both, Your Honor, because as the judge noted, he went through the checklist on the conditions that were going to be imposed. But the judge only mentioned the special conditions, or the judge only intended. I mean, as I read it, the judge then, in his view, was checking off what he considered to be special conditions. I mean, we do distinguish between general conditions and special conditions. And Correct. we expect that, that the judge only has to announce special conditions because the general conditions are as a matter of statute. 
Well, if I, and please correct me if I'm um, misunderstanding, what my position would be would be that um, the judge having gone through this checklist, having directed him to the terms of the probation, this would be um, essentially his, one of his first opportunities to say. That, but I mean, but a judge at sentencing would not say as part of the condition and go over the usual terms that you will not commit another crime, you will not leave the Commonwealth. Those are general terms of conditions. Uh, is it your view that when the clerk says, subject to terms and conditions of, prob of the probation department, that implicit in that are special conditions that are not stated? I would say the way that the, um, that the essentially the colloquy went, um, having broken it into the two separate, the plea being separate from the sentencing, um, at the sentencing they sort of refer back to the taking of the plea, and I think between the two there is reference to these conditions and the way that it's sort of presented is that they're aware that they will be subject to all of the conditions, the usual conditions. But, but Judge Nickerson, I think, said he checked off some conditions. So he did, he did say he did. there were special conditions, which I gather were announced? I believe so, Your clerk, Honor, yes. So the clerk announced some special conditions. Yes, Your Honor. But simply did not announce this one. Correct. This particular, um, this particular condition was not um, announced, okay. but okay. So, so, uh, so you're saying if it was announced, that the defendant would be entitled to say, "Wait, Your Honor, uh, the plea agreement says that I plead guilty only to two years uh, to this particular term. This is a sentence above and beyond that which was agreed to." and therefore I am entitled to withdraw the plea because the sentence exceeds that which was agreed to. Well, I think at that point, um, I mean, if there were any terms that he didn't agree to, I think he would be able to at that point say, this isn't something I'm agreeing to, and the judge could say, fine, we'll give you a trial date then. And I think, um, so if any of the conditions were something that necessarily he didn't want to participate in. So I, th I don't know that the GPS specifically um, okay, but I'm not saying that they're necessarily unique, but you're saying that he would have the opportunity to have withdrawn his plea if the judge had announced it. I, I would Okay, really so now we're an hour later. Let's, the judge has not announced it, and now he's in the probation office, and he says, whoa, what is this? Does he then have the ability then to withdraw his plea? I think he would have the ability to bring it to the court's attention, and I think at that point the court would make a correction. Okay, and let's assume the judge's correction was, no, Mr. Grunman, it is to be GPS. Would he then have the chance to withdraw his plea? I suppose it would be the discretion of the judge at that point. I would, um, I would say he'd be within his discretion to say, no, that this is a mandatory condition and um, have a conversation essentially with the attorneys to determine whether this was something he was aware of. So now I see a problem in that if the judge had announced it, you're telling me the defendant would be entitled to withdraw his plea, but where the judge, or in this case the clerk, failed to say it and the judge failed to note it, that the defendant is worse off because the clerk and the judge failed to do what we would have preferred that they do. Why is that fair? Well, I think in this case we have, um, we were sort of taking that for the sake of argument, but I would point back towards the fact that he doesn't say anything during his, um, the signing of the terms of probation, and again doesn't say anything during the revise and revoke, and I think this points to the idea that he was aware at the time of the sentencing and that it's more a situation where um, there's sort of an opportunity where it wasn't read aloud on the record, that he now seeks to not have the GPS. Okay, so you're saying, perhaps, I'm trying to sort of sort it out, uh, if he had noted it an hour later, maybe he would be entitled to withdraw his plea, but because he failed to do so, he waived that opportunity? Is that essentially what you're telling us? Well, I suppose what I'm saying is that the, the way the circumstances sort of played out sort of point to the idea that um, he most likely 
knew, he was on notice, he was given the notice of the probation terms, and also then when he filed the revise and revoke, this wasn't an issue that he presented. It isn't until much later that, that he decides to. Doesn't that go to the fact that if, if he didn't, if he didn't um, make it part of his revise and revoke, perhaps he didn't know about it? I would think that that goes more, um, that doesn't necessarily support that because he signed his terms of probation and that has significance where he's put his name, he's agreed that he's read these terms, he's agreed that he's going to uphold these terms and where he signs his name, I think there's an expectation that he, he has done what he purported to have done, that he read these terms. Does it matter whether or not counsel was present for when he signed them? in terms of understanding what the consequence is of signing them? I mean, right now you're, you're imposing rather substantial consequence for him signing that. I don't think um, necessarily that in this instance it's of particular significance. And the reason why is because if this were the first time he was truly learning of, of the GPS requirement, I think that in and of itself would have essentially flagged him in a way to say, whoa, this is the first time I'm hearing of it. I don't think he'd need an attorney to, to realize that this is the first time he's- Can you help me remember? I, I know that there was a, uh, a motion to correct. That was denied and a motion for reconsideration that had affidavits from, from counsel that said he wasn't there. Correct. Judge Nickerson issues a, a written decision in response to the motion for reconsideration. Correct. Right? Um, where he finds that there was adequate notice. Did Judge Nickerson make a finding as to whether or not he accepted defense counsel's representation? I don't believe he did, Your Honor. He, he didn't he find didn't one way or the other as to whether or not that was credible, not credible, or? or no, I believe it was simply a denial on the next, on the next reconsideration, part. essentially. That, that it was adequate because of the probation contract. Correct. Well, the uh, Rule 12 allows uh, on an agreed upon plea, there has to be agreement to the, not just to the length of sentence um, and term of probation, but also the uh, conditions of probation. So um, if the um, defendant um, is, is negotiating this plea, and even if it's a mandatory condition, there are certain situations, not many, but certain situations where batter's treatment's a mandatory condition. Correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, um, the jury's gone home, they, they let the jurors go, and now he gets downstairs and he sees on the probation contract, um, oh, I, I have GPS, or, or batter's treatment, or no contact with the kids, really serious issues. Um, d does the defendant have a right to go back in and withdraw the plea? I would think it would truthfully be a matter of timing. If he, um, it, let's say it may be a Let's say it's within you know, 45 minutes. Is there a right to withdraw the plea? I'm not sure there would be a right to withdraw the plea. I think he may have to go through um, like a, a motion for a new trial to try to withdraw the plea on that ground. And because at that point, once the plea has been taken, I would say that that may be a discretionary um, think for the judge to consider it given the time. I know we have some cases that talk about sort of fixing the sentencing in the other direction when it's such a short amount of time, a matter of hours coming back. Um, but I would, I would say that it, he would have other remedies to pursue it. Like? He could move to withdraw his plea through and, a... And the judge could say denied. But if he had, but you, I mean, it's problematic that if the judge does what he's supposed to do and announce it, he can say, whoa, this is now, this is greater than what I pled guilty to. I wish to withdraw my plea, and he's entitled to do so. But where the judge doesn't do that, you're saying he, he loses that entitlement. I think once the plea has become final, then as a matter of sort of course and procedure, the next step is to then say a Rule 30B motion, my plea wasn't knowing involuntary or, or going along that route. I don't necessarily think that, you know, if it was a matter of moments later that a judge might not try to step back and I, I would be guessing as to how he would exercise his discretion, but. Um, but the, the, the problem I have, which I'm, you have a minute and a half to resolve for me is why does, 
the defendant lose an entitlement because the judge or the clerk does not do what we expect them to do. It's not the defendant's fault that they didn't announce it. It may be his attorney's foolishness to not have advised him, but uh, if I'm a defendant, why am I worse off because the judge didn't announce it at the time? Well, I think that given the circumstances of this overarching case, I believe he was already on. Put, I understand your argument to say, okay, we should find that there was actual notice at the time of plea. I, I get that. Let's assume for the moment that we don't buy that. I don't know whether we will or not, but let's assume we don't. So let's stick with the notion that he is shocked, shocked to find that it's GPS, and but he finds it after the plea is over and he's gone down to the clerk's office as opposed to at the time of the, of the sentencing? Uh, well, I would direct the court to, I mean, if it were a situation where, say, he finds this um, um, weeks later, that the procedure would be to try to withdraw his plea and to say, listen, this wasn't knowing involuntary, and it would go back to the sentencing judge, presumably. And at that point, if he denied it, he would have the opportunity to appeal it, and he could follow the normal course. And I... Well, I understand it's it's best to have it read on the record. I do feel that this is a little bit more in the flavor of the Williamson case, um, and I see I'm running uh, but, out of time. But, in, but, but in, I mean, it's all right. But I mean, but in Williamson, in fairness, it was discussed, and and they said there was really no surprise. You knew full well when you said guilty that you had that as a condition. So. I think I think the distinct the only thing that I would call the court's attention to is while they do. Um, make the distinction that it's um, throughout the colloquy before, but they do also call out that it's talked about after the taking is the plea as well. So I don't think it's necessarily ruled out to consider what happens subsequent to the taking of the plea as evidence that he was Would it on be notice. an ineffective assistance of counsel claim? GPS is a big deal, so measurably below. And it certainly, it sounds like it would make a difference. So would and the it, method be ineffective assistance of and counsel? And it is of note that the defendant never raises that as an issue and is presumably satisfied with representation in court, but I understand that doesn't necessarily resolve the issue. All right, thank you. Thank you.